Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, AIIA ACT event. Citizenship can be a vexing issue for some, particularly those parliamentarians caught up in section 441 of the constitution a few years ago. Tonight, we're fortunate to have with us one of Australia's leading experts on citizenship and administrative law, Professor Kim Rubenstein. Kim is a regular media commentator and has appeared as legal counsel before the Administrative uh, Review Tribunal, the Federal Court of Australia and the High Court. She was a member of the independent committee that reviewed the Australian citizenship test in 2008. Kim's currently on leave from the University of Canberra where she is co-director of the 5050 by 2030 Foundation. Now, in previous election campaigns, uh, the branches heard from representatives of the major parties about their foreign policy platforms. As you know, Kim is a, an independent candidate for the ACT Senate in the current campaign. So we're also looking forward to hearing from her her thoughts on how foreign policy should be framed to serve the interests of the community. Now, we have a short presentation tonight as Kim needs to depart early for a candidate's forum in Gungahlin, just north for those of us outside the ACT. So uh, uh, Kim uh, will speak for 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll take some questions, uh, which I will curate. We aim to finish by 6.30 p.m. this evening. So without any further ado, let me hand over to you, Kim. Well, thank you, Heath. And thank you all for coming out on what is rather cold and miserable night. And so in many ways, perhaps me cutting this short is a blessing for you to get home to a warmer environment. But um, when I realised there was a clash, we worked out a way that I could have the best of both worlds and at least come and speak to you for a little bit, give you some time to ask me some questions, but also to let you know that I'm here in Canberra. And so you can contact me at any point after tonight to follow up any of our discussions. I'd really be keen to do that. I'd be keen to do that on a personal level, regardless of the fact that I'm running as an independent and want to engage with the constituency, because it is something that, interestingly for me, as I reflect on it, is very much part of the core of my being, both as a personal and a professional sense, a real commitment to active citizenship, which has what has driven my really professional life, and in many ways led me to focus on legal and normative questions of citizenship and membership in all of the work that I've done. And so sitting here as a candidate tonight, whilst being entirely new, I really haven't done it before and I'm not used to those core flutes on the side of the road or people recognising me in the street now, which is quite odd. Um, in many ways, it does actually feel extremely um, natural in the sense of wanting to engage with people about the ways in which we engage as human beings and conduct ourselves in our governance arrangements. Um, and in thinking about governance, and even though it's dark outside, I do want to ground myself in country and to recognise that we are here on um, Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and to recognise elders, past, present and emerging, but also in that statement to ground ourselves as human beings in the environment and to recognise that we are all responsible for the environment, both uh, in a meaningful way as the actual environment, but also the environment within which we act as human beings in a social sense. And it really is part of that that is driving me to, for the first time, put my hand up to um, be a candidate at this federal election and to link it to my professional life in the sense that um, my stand as an independent is really the first time that I've felt that I could authentically put myself up as a candidate in the sense that all of my work on citizenship, which I am going to move to um, in a moment, has been about the issues, the public policy around membership, which has led me to be an advisor to both sides of government, in addition to having been on that independent committee that reviewed the citizenship test, I was also the um, principal advisor on the redrafting of the 2007 Australian Citizenship Act, which effectively rewrote the 1948 Australian Citizenship Act, which is where I'm about to go next in our discussion. And that process of advising government on the legislation really um, impressed upon me how fundamental it is to have people in parliament who really are committed to good public policy and how much politics can often get in the way of good public policy and the partisanship 
that I saw even in, the, in relation to that evolution of that bill into an act was what really made me resist the notion of going into politics or expressing that active citizenship because I really felt that the parties were not leading to necessarily always the best public policy outcome. What was the best political outcome in the sense of winning an election is not necessarily the best public outcome for the whole of the community. So with the rise of independence around the country and with the opportunity here in the Senate, in the ACT of a winnable seat, it was the first time that the forces aligned for me to feel, well, I can stay authentic to being an independent and to bring that expertise into parliament, knowing also that no matter who wins in the lower house in this coming election, there is an absolute certainty that neither of the major parties are going to have a majority in the Senate. So my role as an independent on the crossbench could really be significant. Um, I mean, the crossbench will be where the balance of power lies. And we have the prospect of uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation or Clive Palmer's United Australia Party as being on that crossbench. And so my role on that crossbench could be key for the entire nation, not only just for having a direct voice for Canberrans. So it feels um, that each of these forces made, made it um, for me a, a sense that if I didn't put up my hand now to have a go at this, um, then I would always wonder if I should have. And uh, I've found the process an extremely energising and stimulating one. I mean, as many of you know, I started last August in setting up the party. So I'll come back to questions about that because that um, I'm sure is of interest to you in terms of your vote over the next uh, 10 days. Um, but to ground it back to citizenship and international relations, I guess the first point to make in terms of my views on foreign policy are that as a senator and as an independent in the Senate, my voice will be out there, but of course, it's the executive government that determines foreign policy in this country in terms of separation of powers and the constitutional foundations to our system. There is an immense power in the executive government, that sovereign power, that prerogative power that I teach students about, all revolves around foreign affairs in the sense of its immense power. And there might be something you would come back to as to whether that is appropriate in a democratic framework. But ultimately, my role on the Senate will be to be a voice about that executive decision making, but I actually won't have a role to play because it is not often legislative, it is largely executive. Um, but with a public voice that it's um, hopefully will um, influence decision making. But I think that's a key point to make when people do ask me my own position on foreign affairs. Um, there's a broad principled approach um, in terms of the appropriate role of diplomacy and so forth. Um, but to be mindful of the fact that run my role as a senator has limitations by virtue of our constitutional system. Um, and that's interesting. But it's through citizenship and its actual links between domestic and international law that brought me up to Canberra to be the director um, of the Centre for International and Public Law, where I was from 2006 to 2016 as the professor and director there. And it's the linking of international law with domestic law that has always motivated my interest in international law. And <laughs> citizenship is the perfect frame to understand that because it, it actually has two faces in a way. And those two faces can be nicely described by the different language we use for the international and the domestic. When we're thinking about citizenship in international law, we use the term nationality. And it is actually the principles of nationality in international law that are key. So for instance, concepts of diplomatic protection and the right of a state to assert its sovereignty in relation to its nationals. Those are some of the issues that become really pertinent in the international framework. And it's the international human rights framework that also provides a, uh, an understanding or a structure for the role of the national in an in international um, sense. And interestingly, most of human rights law does actually not distinguish between the national and the non-national. It's about the personhood 
And I'll come back to that shortly in relation to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which does give attention to nationality, which also was a, a frame for me to think about putting myself up as a, as a candidate at this election. But the link in a domestic sense is that the national becomes the citizen in a domestic context, that it is for the sovereign right of the state to determine who is and isn't a citizen of that state. So there's a slight tension often, and there is a major international law case of Notterbaum um, and Liechtenstein, where after the Second World War, Mr. Notterbaum, who had been born in Germany, so was formerly a German citizen, and who had gone to Guatemala during the Second World War to, to protect himself and his family, and had developed a very um, lucrative business. But through the offices of the United States government, the Guatemalan government had taken all of his property as a German foreign alien in Guatemala at the time. And, the, and, and um, at that time, he had also managed to buy himself Liechtensteinian citizenship to what he thought would protect himself during the Second World War. And it was the Liechtensteinian government who sought to assert diplomatic protection for him as one of his as one of its nationals or a citizen of Liechtenstein to challenge the Guatemalan government's possession of his property and also his detention and uh, what it was indefinite detention during the Second World War that raised really significant issues about the sovereignty of the state and Liechtenstein to assert its responsibility to protect him and international law's view of when a state can actually assert that to seek protection against another country that is, is harming that individual. And the International Court of Justice ultimately determined that Liechtenstein didn't have the right in that circumstance, even though it's the sovereign right of the state to determine its own citizens, it could treat him as a citizen for its own purposes but it couldn't assert it for international law because it determined that there had to be a real and meaningful connection with the country of citizenship. Now, they, the international court determined it wasn't because he hadn't lived a significant period of time in Liechtenstein and so forth, that that wasn't sufficient. But if you think about it more, which country, and I haven't given you enough details, but which country did he have the most real and meaningful connection to? turned out to be actually Guatemala because that's where he'd lived most of his life and he had not really maintained a strong connection to his German nationality, which as a matter of law he had lost when he'd become a Liechtensteinian citizenship. So all I'm doing here is to show you it is quite complicated when we come to the intersection between domestic citizenship law and international law in relation to nationality. And that can be problematic for Australian citizens when they are abroad. And that is where I wanna take the last few minutes of my discussion, because it was those 30,000 plus Australian citizens who were stranded during COVID that enlivened my most recent public um, discussion and a lot of media attention during COVID. Because for those Australian citizens, they were effectively trapped outside of Australia mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that the Australian government closed its borders and placed restrictions, not through any citizenship framework, but through the Air Navigation Act, which restricted airlines from bringing in more than a certain number of people during COVID, which had an impact not only on Australian citizens, of course, but on any person who was wanting to travel to Australia. And so the hook again with international law is that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in Article 12 says that it is the right for a person to leave and return from their home. Now, it's even more broad than their citizenship from their home um, um, as a matter of international law. And so I was contacted by Geoffrey Robertson, who you will all know as a barrister and advocate outside of Australia, because there were some Australians who had been caught outside mm. who wanted to challenge the lawfulness of the Australian government's um, decisions. And they recognise that in order to use the facilities of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights through the 
optional protocol, which gives Australian citizens the right to go to the Human Rights Committee of the ICCPR to complain of breaches of any of the provisions of the ICCPR, that the normal course is that you have to have exhausted your domestic remedies. Uh -huh. So the question to me as the expert on Australian citizenship law was, has there in practice been the exhaustion of domestic remedies? And my answer was yes, and this would require another whole hour, but in essence to ca encapsulate it, because there is no protection of citizenship as a formal status in Australian law, there were very limited frameworks for those Australian citizens to have any domestic recourse. And the only way that could have been done would have been to actually assert a right as an Australian citizen that is not a written right, but one that one would have to draw from common law principles of constitutional protection through a rule of law notion. Now, I think there are arguments to be made on that front, but the practical reality is that you would have to have gone through the first level of the federal court and appeal court and the High Court, which would have taken more than three years. And there is jurisprudence in the international court framework and the Human Rights Committee that anything that would take more than three years is in effect an exhaustion of remedies if there is an immediate breach. And so my opinion went in with the application to the ICCPR, um, a Human Rights Committee for an application. And interestingly and unusually, the committee made a, um, an interim measure which is to say that there is a grave breach of, of, of Article 12 and Australia should do all that it can immediately to return those Australian citizens. And the Australian government's response was that it disagreed with the interpretation of that committee and um, provided reasons which would have then led to the further determination of that issue. Now, since that time, of course, Australia's borders have reopened and so the case did not come to any final decision. But I think... For me, it was another framework into enlivening my sense of our own political landscape here. Why was it, coming back to constitutional principles, that our government, which had the power over, the, over quarantine, chose not to assert that power and to close borders and to not enable Australian citizens to travel back immediately in a health protective way? Because, of course, we all would agree that we didn't want COVID streaming in. But with the quarantine power, it would have been possible to very quickly set up quarantine stations around the country purposely set up for Australian citizens to come back in, to be properly quarantined, to have stimulated the construction industry, and stimulated protection for Australian citizens at the same time. And to me, that reflected a lack of diversity in our Australian parliament. You know, 49% of Australians have a parent born outside of Australia or themselves were born outside of Australia and so would have had family outside of Australia that they too were, were prevented from going and visiting during that period. They couldn't leave Australia during that period. And um, it enlivened me to think that this is a moment where we do need to, to place greater attention on executive power and its proper exercise and the development of policy over a whole range of issues that I'm more than happy to answer any questions now over the next 15 minutes. Okay, thanks very much, Kim. So we'll move straight to questions then. Ingrid, uh, could you just let us know who you are and uh, yes, speak uh, speak up? Thank you very much, Kim. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm an Australian citizen. Yes. Born in Germany. I, you know, to come back to the large proportion of people yes. who were uh, who were born overseas, yes. who had a parent born overseas. Yes, that 49%. To me, percent. Yes. To me it, it is absolutely absurd. And I'd like to get your reaction to it. Yes. It's going back to the current Australian laws. Yes. Well, as a dual, dual citizen, I, I haven't got dual no. citizenship. I so you had, had to, to give up your journey. At that. that stage, I could be now. But you can have all sorts of offices, but you can't run for parliament. parliament yes. And in a country where you've got such a huge proportion of people I with agree. dual citizenship, the people themselves who live here never doubt themselves yes. their loyalty to Australia, Indeed. yet they are prohibited to yes. 
you know, to sit in Parliament. Are you going to do something about that? I would love to do something about it. And it's about step by step processes. So Ingrid, as you probably saw during that period when there were all those dual citizens, I was also very publicly out there to say, this is actually a statement of our success as a multicultural nation to have so many people who are falling foul of it. That, you know, it really is a mark of a progressive democratic society for people to immediately feel that they want to be part of our democratic system and to serve the public. And that there is not, you know, if I try to put it in, ter in the terms of thinking about the difference between par parenthood and marriage. If you think of citizenship like marriage, then we do believe in monogamy and you can only have one, one uh, partner. But if you think of citizenship like parenthood, how many people ever question when they go from having one child to having another child that they're somehow undermining their sense of love or commitment or connection to their first child? That we live in a world where citizenship is like parenthood. And it's only when there is a direct conflict with having two children, I know that sometimes that occurs, but it is only when there is that direct conflict that you should have to then consider where your so-called allegiance lies. And I do think that we need to remedy Section 44.1. And in fact, so many parliamentary reviews have said that we have to, and it shows the failure of our political system that we haven't had bipartisanship because this is not just about them staying in power, which is how often cynics refer to it, this is about enabling our democracy to be fully represented. Now, it does require constitutional change. So my plan is that we move first with the Uluru Statement from the Heart, because that is foundational to our sense of, uh, of reconciliation. And that we, um, sorry, um, that we make that the first priority for constitutional change. I think that we really will be able to get significant support for that as a nation, particularly if I'm on the crossbench and can draw each of those members of the parties, both Labor and Liberal members of parties who have stood up in support of that, but the party system has caught it, got it caught, we could actually draw out a bipartisan approach to moving forward with the Uluru Statement from Heart for the Heart as a referendum proposal. When that gets passed, which I really believe it would, we can then say to people who say, oh, it needs constitutional change, that will never happen. Look, we've just made this first constitutional change. We know how to do it. And for a multicultural society, we need to move with Section 44.1 as well. And the third part of the equation, of course, is to move to a republic. So those three things would see Australia coming, to, coming, coming of age in its reconciliation with um, First Nations Australians, <coughs> with its affirmation of a multicultural society and our independence secure in our own self being able to have an Australian citizen as the head of state. All right. Any other questions? Uh, okay, Bill and Susan. Thanks, Kim. Hello, uh, Bill. One of the things that struck me about citizenship at the moment is the tremendous backlog yes. of unprocessed applications yes, for citizenship. Yes. Yes when within my own memory, there have been campaigns by governments to encourage people who are eligible under the Act yes. to put in applications Absolutely. for citizenship. Yeah. Uh, do you think as a matter of urgency that whichever party emerges to form government needs to address this issue with resources so yes. that people who have been um, attracted by the idea of citizenship yep. can actually take it up? Look, it is such a, it's such a powerful question, Bill, and it's such a reflection of, of multiple issues that are problematic in Australia at the moment. One of them is just the support for our public service, for it to be able to do its job. The caps on, on, on staffing and the outsourcing of so much of the public service has undermined the capacity of the public service to do its job properly. It's also undermined the independence to an extent in terms of frank and fearless advice, but that's another issue. But in addition, there is a change in approach to not only citizenship processing times, but approaches to what I would call um, uh, decision-making, which can either err on the side of inclusion or exclusion. The cases, I've kept my practising certificate, as you know, throughout, and I've run some of the cutting-edge citizenship cases, as he said, in the, in the High Court and the Federal Court and the tribunals. And there are cases where I've won where it is so obvious that there was a straightforward approach that we were uh, we were advocating for someone to be recognized as a citizen but the commonwealth did everything it could to err on the side of exclusion rather than inclusion 
that is a decision of, um, of policy that is so unhealthy in a multicultural society and undermines um, what, as you said, has been a history of growing and encouraging people to become citizens rather than resisting them. Now, I think this is, you know, um, the stuff of multiple PhDs, but I think it is also about um, a, um, the wedging and bipartisanship in a very negative way that needs to be broken. And as an independent on the crossbench, I'm truly committed to moving on not only that issue, but of course, the approach to refugees generally. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Susan. No. Susan Grace, <clears throat> um, branch member. Um, Kim, where do you stand on the issue of um, Australian dual citizens yes. who can be stripped of their citizenship yes. if they've Thank committed you. terrorist yes. offences yes. or typically in Iraq and Syria yes. by joining ISIS? Yes. yes. So that is another, that's the third um, part of my public sort of um, outreach during that period. So in December 2015, the government amended the Citizenship Act to enable dual citizens to be stripped of citizenship. And my theme since that time has been to say how undermining that is of a um, normative notion of citizenship. You're creating two classes of citizens, those who are sole citizens who cannot have their citizenship stripped and dual citizens who can, even though their lived experience may be exactly the same. It might just be a formal reality, which we often know is the case, that has led to that capacity. And I think um, on, many, on many levels, again, that is um, undermining of a liberal democratic notion of membership of the community. And I, think, I mean, the other aspect of it, of it is, is how counterintuitive it is in the sense that normally, the more you have of something, the better it is. Whereas here in Australia, the more citizenships you have, the more vulnerable your Australian citizenship is. And I think that is really um, an indictment again on our, our executive government that has taken that step because it really makes so many Australian citizens vulnerable. And it is the beginning of a slippery slope. At the moment, it is about terrorism. And there are better ways. It's not to say that we should be soft on terrorism in any sense, but we should be using our criminal law as, as the frame for dealing with terrorists, not your citizenship law. And once you do do that, you do undermine that security of membership of the community, which then does create social disintegration. And, and, and the experts in the security world are saying it also undermines Australia's capacity to do something on an international level, because once they're no longer citizens, you do not have the reach that you might have had. You're basically enabling those people to harm Australian citizens who live in the diaspora because they become more vulnerable to the activity of those Australian citizens who have been stripped of their citizenship. So thanks mm -hmm. for the question. Any other questions? We've got time for one more, I think. Yes. Oh. Hello. Um, as I mentioned before with you earlier, I'm studying law at the moment and I'm actually currently studying Australian public law this semester. Great. So a lot of the content is quite relevant. Great. Um, I'd like to ask you about your opinion about, for example, the Minister of the Home Affairs and Immigration's like quote godlike powers yes. and citizen citizenship. Yes. Because whilst there has been abuses in instances of that, for example, in the cases of many refugees, yes. it's kept people like Novak Djokovic out yes. from competing in the Australian Open and inciting yes. anti-vax and yes. like yes. um yes, advice. So I'd just like to ask you, do you see yes. like an inherent value in that type of executive power that's absent from legislative yes. review. Great. And also, just as a side note, um, if you were to be elected to the Senate, can you do anything about that to make sure it doesn't reach yes. authoritarian, dictatorial yes. kind of... Yes, yes. Look, it's an excellent question. It's clear. Yes. yes. So Claire has raised a really important point, which is that within our um, legislative framework, there are times that you do want the minister to have some discretion but theoretically and historically, that's to be able to take into account the needs of an un, un, a sort of foreseen scenario where you can actually err more on the side of inclusion rather than exclusion, because the Migration Act, as it developed, became more and more regulatory and more and more prescriptive. And so the idea was for the minister to have an extra discretion so that in those hard cases when things were so regulated and a person 
who really needed support couldn't get it through the formal law that it would give a discretion to enable that positive, inclusive approach. Yet, in the similar vein to my answer to Bill, they're actually using it as a way to exclude rather than include. And that is really dangerous in terms, as you said, of a more authoritarian, less accountable framework. Now, as you will learn in um, administrative law, and you would have touched a little bit in public law, what you do with those discretions is in between elections, you have a framework for an independent tribunal to review those discretions. So the Administrative Appeals Tribunal is there for that very purpose, to be able to have an independent body review that minister's discretion, taking into account the broad policy, but the specifics of that particular person's case. And what has happened over the years is that that tribunal has been stacked with former politicians and advisors rather than independent decision makers. So it's undermining those liberal democratic structures that are meant to keep a check over that excessive discretion. So if you have a look on my website, my integrity agenda is not only about setting up the Independent Commission Against Corruption, sorry, that's telling us at 6.30, but to also re re-value um, and to restore freedom of information um, frameworks, which have been undermined, the independence of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, and further um, restore the Ombudsman's Office, because that role also is to keep a check on excessive discretion. And so, yes, the answer is I am going to, in the Senate, seek to amend legislation specifically for those integrity measures but we need to review the Migration Act in, and um, aspects of the Citizenship Act that we've referred to earlier in terms of um, improper um, power over the minister, which is not accountable enough because the systems of accountability have been so undermined. And well, I'm we might uh, draw it to a, a close yes, there given yeah. the time constraints. Uh, on behalf of the branch, uh, Kim, I'd like to thank you so very much okay. for packing 60 minutes into 30 minutes. I'm yes, sure there have I'm been many more questions ask... that could have come out, but on another occasion, we'd like to see you return well, to the branch. I was going to say, I, regardless of the outcome in the Senate <laughs> here, I would really love to come back and have right. uh, to do a, a part two of this presentation, Indeed. either as your senator or as a continuing expert in this field, because I think they are really pressing issues that we need to agitate more about. And, um, and I'm really grateful for your interest tonight. As Thank a token you. of our appreciation, do accept a little memento. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck on Thank you very Thank you very much. And for not being able to stay and speak a bit more and I really do encourage you to get in contact if you'd like. We'll see you, we'll see you once again later. <laughs>